About five years ago, I was at an event. I was hosting an event in Sydney and we had 20 of our clients in the room. And someone asked me, Ben, what are your top books? What are the top books that I should be reading right now? And it's funny because that one person out of a group of 20 people, I sat down for about half an hour and I wrote down the list and I really thought about it. And I handed him the list and I told everyone else the list. Everyone jotted it down. Six months later, he reached out to me and he said, Ben, I finished all the books. What's next? Now, the reason I bring this up isn't just because he made an inspiring decision and did something empowered. There was about 20 books on the list. But I noticed a huge shift in this person. You see, in the room, everyone was equal. They were equal at marketing. They were equal at sales. They were all really starting out on their journeys. They were all underneath $10,000 per month in their business and they wanted to grow. And you see, he grew so much faster than everyone else. He became a better copywriter. He became a better business person. He had a great capacity to think. He developed his mind. And for me, that was such a simple and easy thing to do that no one else in the room did. And I'm not sure where Nick is today, but I'm sure he's doing something really amazing and really empowering with his life because he really committed to this journey of self-development. I should definitely reach out to him and check in and see where he's at. So look, today I want to share with you the wisdom book list. So this is a bit different. If you listened to the episode last week, I spoke a lot about business books and the top 10 business books I believe people should read on their way to seven figures. Now, that's very yang, right? Very structural, all about your marketing, your sales, your systems, your team. But I believe that the golden mean of business is found in personal development and systems. You know, we're called systems for business, right? We present that way, obviously, as a business. But I really believe that the yin and yang of business is both. And it's the people who strive to develop themselves personally and go to the top of the top, the greatest ideas, the greatest philosophies, the greatest theologies, the greatest studies, the greatest science. They're the people who really leave a lasting impact on their clients, leave a lasting impact on the world, and they really uh, power through things. My mentor, Dr. John D. Martini, who's a very inspiring person to me, he's what you would call a polymath. And a polymath is a person who essentially studies the logos. The logos is, so you've got ologies. So they're the expressions of the logos. Logos is a Greek um, word for something called the word or the way that knowledge expresses itself. So he's studying every single branch of knowledge on the tree of wisdom. So you have obviously biology, you have physics, you have mathematics, you have all the sciences. Then you have sociology, you have art, you have business, you have a economics, all of these are what you would call an ology. And the real growth that I've personally found in my life is when I've committed to going outside of the sphere. This podcast today is really trying to expand you a little bit beyond the typical horizons. Because for me personally, I can tell you this, at least 50% of my growth as a human being and as a business person has come outside of the realm of business where I've been able to find a piece of wisdom, find something outside of the realm and bring it back to my business in a unique way. So here's the first book. The book is called The Origins and History of Consciousness by Eric Newman. So this book is going real deep, real fast and is perhaps the most challenging book that I will mention today. I've got 12 books for you uh, today. So this book specifically is a very, very powerful book. I actually read this when I was in Peru. I went and did an ayahuasca ceremony in Peru, and I had 10 days there pretty much on a silent retreat uh, taking ayahuasca. We did three sessions, and I actually read this book, and it was really interesting because it's quite a scientific study. Uh, So Eric Newman is a psychiatrist and psychologist, I believe, from Germany. And he was a student of Carl Jung, who you'll see in a minute. He is going to come up uh, in just a second. Someone I really respect as a big genius in the world. But essentially what this book is about is Eric Newman traces the origins of 
what we know about culture and consciousness. And he comes up with some incredibly profound insights because you see, in the world, mythology is often thought of as just that myth. You would say a myth is something that's not real. But what Eric Newman says in his book is that mythology is the first insight into consciousness. And as mythology arises, consciousness arises. So there's this beautiful link between the stories that have been told throughout history and our conscious awareness. And if you look at it, really, stories are the oldest things. Stories are the culture bringers. They are the things that have existed longer than all the pyramids, longer than the oldest structures that we can find. So it's not necessarily the physical things, it's the metaphysical things that we find. And this is really... Like for for a lot of people, metaphysics is something that is esoteric. You know, you can't touch it, you can't feel it. But all you need to do is go and study mythology. There's your metaphysics. And there's great wisdom. There's great wisdom. One of the philosophies of my life is the older something is, the more value you will find in it because it stood the test of time, right? If you look back to the times of Babylonia or the times of ancient Greece and you've got books that still exist today, there's a reason that they exist because they've been passed from hand to hand, from student to student, and the torch has been passed all the way down throughout history. And the reason is, is because it's connected with people. You know, you only have to look at Disney. Disney, as a business, took old myths from old ages and just revived them and then taught them to children. And the reason that these myths connect with us in such a powerful way is because they match our spiritual nature. We're all on this mythological journey. There's a power of mythology. And by studying this book, The Origins and History of Consciousness by Eric Newman, you will see that. Stick with it. It's a a challenging book. It's not something that's very easy to read. It's very scholarly. It's very, you know, it's very, there's a lot of uh, footnotes, let's say. But this is one of the books that I recommend most often for people who want to understand the nature of things because it's the the way that things have evolved uh, throughout history. And it's something that will improve your capacity as a business owner because you will understand the power of myth. You will understand the power of story. You will understand that we are all on this journey. You will empathize with other people's journey and you will become a master of not just always looking for things in the present day, but also looking at the ancient wisdom that has existed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And I can tell you that the ancient wisdom that I've found in my own life has helped me become a better business owner in modern times. So that's what this book is all about. Second book, The Story of Philosophy by Will Durant. This is one of my favorite books in the world and it's so beautifully written. So Will Durant is a really famous historian. So he wrote a 13 volume epic called The Story of Civilization. I have it in my library. It's my my goal of my life to actually read those books because they're so dense and there's so many of them. But this little book, The story of philosophy breaks down the major philosophers all the way from Socrates and Plato and, you know, some of the first guys. I think Thales, a man called Thales was the first philosopher, then into Pythagoras and then from Pythagoras into Socrates and Plato and then into Aristotle and then it kind of goes from there. So what he does is he shows you how philosophy has evolved throughout time. And philosophy, the very word philosophy comes from ancient Greek roots. Philo is love and Sophia is wisdom. So the philosopher, it's about loving wisdom. So this is all what philosophy is about. Again, for many people, philosophy is something very esoteric, not very practical. For me, I've found very, very practical insights into philosophy. I think a lot of modern philosophy doesn't connect with me uh, so much, but a lot of the ancient philosophers really, really connect with me and it helps me to see the world in a different way. They teach me about the universal laws and how I can use these laws in my own life to grow and find more harmony. For me, that's what philosophy is about. How do we find harmony in life? How do we love our life, love the people around us? How do we have great intimacy in our life and how do we grow? 
love and wisdom, right? These are the two things that we're working towards, yin and yang. The wisdom is yang, the love is perhaps yin, or maybe it's reversed, who knows? Okay, next book, Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson. I told this story once uh, in another podcast that I ran. I'm going to tell it again because it's very, very beautiful. So there's a passage in the book. Actually, there's two stories I'll tell you from this book. There's a passage in the book, Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson. Now, at this stage, da Vinci has become a very powerful artist in the world. Everyone knows him. He's the guy, essentially, in the art world. And the richest and most powerful people are all asking him, Leonardo, we'll give you this castle. We'll give you all of this wealth. We'll set you up here. We'll set you up there. We'll do anything that you want. Please paint our portrait. So kings, the aristocrats, every wealthy, powerful individual, the Pope, and all of da Vinci's friends around him are saying, Leonardo, just do the painting. Just do do the thing. Everyone wants him to do it. And he keeps turning them down. And there's a really amazing piece where he goes away and he just doesn't get back to anyone. Well, he's got all of these people making requests. And he goes away into the mountains to study birds for the whole summer. So he goes away for like six months to study birds. I really love that. Now, there's another piece in the book that people don't really know about Leonardo da Vinci, but He was more than just an artist. This guy was a scientist. He was a polymath. He was another one of these rare characters, these rare individuals. So he would get dead bodies. He had a uh, arrangement with uh, a specific morgue and he would get dead bodies and he would study them and he would pick them apart and dissect them because he wanted to understand how the muscles in the body work, just because he was incredibly curious. Now, in the book, they describe that 400 years later, someone was uh, studying the heart because they couldn't figure out how does blood enter into the heart, but like, how does this all work? You know, what's going on here? And they figured out that the heart had four reverse ventricles in them. So blood could pump in, but it couldn't come out. And someone said, you know, who else has studied this? You know, who else has has done this? And they found Leonardo da Vinci's codexes, his um, journals that he kept, very extensive journals in his life. And they went back and studied it. And he had discovered that 400 years earlier and he never told anyone. He just wrote it down in his book. And I thought, and that was a big scientific discovery when this happened 400 years later. And for me, that's always encouraged me in a lot of ways that, Sometimes you may be ahead of your time. Sometimes you may not even in your lifetime get credit for the things that you discover and the things that you do, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't follow those pathways. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't own your uniqueness, own your creativity, and really follow the paths that inspire you. I actually have this beautiful book. Uh, It's a very large book. I bought it for myself for my birthday one year. It's all of da Vinci's paintings and drawings in a huge like A5 sort of uh, book, very, very heavy, weighs about 20 kilos. And I used to have it open next to my desk on an easel. And I, I kept it open at that page where he had that drawing of the heart and the description of the ventricles because I wanted to remind myself to play the long game. And to, to follow the things that I am fiercely passionate about, not for money, but because those are the things that really light my soul on fire. And Da Vinci for me is the pillar of that. And today it's really interesting because he is remembered as the greatest creative genius that ever lived. And I think he had the courage to follow what was unique to him. And that's very rare in, uh, in the world today. Next one is Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. And look, I just want to note that this book list, I've created this really specifically to hit different things. As you'll notice so far, I've hit mythology because I believe that's incredibly important. I've hit philosophy because you want to know how the greatest minds that have ever existed thought about the nature of reality. I've hit Leonardo da Vinci because he's the greatest creative genius in my view that is perhaps ever lived. Now we're on to Steve Jobs. The reason I'm sharing this is because Steve Jobs, this book 
is pretty crazy because he just has this vision of the future and he does not compromise on that vision for a second. You know, if you've seen the movie or you've engaged, it's actually based on a lot of the research that Walter Isaacson did in his book and really was able to create a lot of that on the back of it. So, look, he's not remembered as the most uh, lovely guy to be around because he just had this reality distortion field where he was just so passionate about what he wanted, why he wanted it, and how he was going to achieve it. And he was quite a spiritual guy, which was quite interesting. Uh, There's a lot of jokes in the book that he never used to shower and he used to come in and actually stink all the time because he was just off the wall um, as a guy. But his noted goal, his noted aim for his life was that he wanted to increase the consciousness of the planet. And it's funny because in a lot of the biographies that I've read, people like Benjamin Franklin and Da Vinci and Steve Jobs and Carl Jung and Buckminster Fuller, these people are perhaps the greatest geniuses that ever lived and they all share that. They share this goal that their goal was to increase the consciousness of the planet. And it's funny because they also increase the material wealth of the planet as well. And for me, those are the two real big focuses of business. How can we increase the consciousness of others whilst concurrently increasing their material wealth, matter and spirit? How can we hold both of these candles and grow in both of these areas? And I think that creates a really meaningful existence. So Steve Jobs can teach you how to be a better entrepreneur, can teach you how to fail. It can teach you how to succeed really, really well. You know, he was removed from his own business. You know, imagine that. Imagine building a business for 10, 15 years and building it to this huge business and then getting removed. And then he goes and starts Pixar and that's a multi-billion dollar enterprise. He comes back and takes Apple uh, into the business that is uh, known today and has connected the world in a really unique way, you know, through his technology. The next one is perhaps my favorite book on this list, just personally, because I really connect with the teachings of Carl Jung. So this is Carl Jung's autobiography. Notice here, there's a lot of biographies and autobiographies. I believe there, you know, you can really learn a lot uh, from these. It's called Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. And what Carl Jung does is he breaks down his dreams, the key dreams that he had throughout his whole life. And he shows you that the unconscious mind, his unconscious mind was trying to communicate with him through his life. And he developed this really beautiful relationship with it. And that's the reason why I've put this book in here, because I believe trusting your unconscious mind is an incredibly valuable asset. I call it a superpower, and I believe it's been one of my biggest superpowers. You know, when I don't know where to go, when I don't know what to do, when I feel stuck, when I feel down, when I just am in that place, there's a certain surrender that can happen. And these, for me, have been the moments of the huge quantum shifts, not these linear growth where you go from zero to a little bit better. For me, it's about trust and learning to trust that there's an unconscious mind and that unconscious mind is unfathomably deep and complex and there is so much there to go into. You know, if you just study dreams and you look at dreams, there is a whole alternate reality going on by the time we close our eyes and go to sleep. You you taste things, you touch things, you feel things and you're literally in your unconscious mind. You know, I've been really blessed in my life to actually have quite a lot of lucid dreams and where I've actually woken up in my dreams and realized that I've been dreaming. And I've read a lot of books about it. So it's not something that I actually studied and, and tried to do. It happens every so often. And when it happens, you can actually talk to yourself in your dreams. It's really, really fascinating. It's hard to maintain because it's so intense. But if you can do that, you know, that's, that's super powerful. I think there's a lot of wisdom uh, in dreams. I get a lot of answers uh, from this sort of stuff. And like I say, it's a superpower, right? Because imagine if you had this hidden, untapped resource that you could just constantly tap into. You're looking for signs and symbols, you know, and I think Carl Jung was a master of that. And he's really inspired me to uh, tread down that path. 
Next one is the metaphysics of Buckminster Fuller. A Buckminster Fuller, I have him tattooed on my arm. He's one of my favorite people throughout history. I believe that him and Jung are two of the greatest creative geniuses of the past 100 years or 150 years. So Buckminster Fuller, he was a poet. He was an engineer. He was an artist. He created the geodesic dome. So if you've ever seen a big geodesic dome, he actually created those and you know popularized the, the concept of geodesic domes. I believe he had the most patents uh, existing at any one time about 100 years ago. He was an inventor. He was a scientist. He was an author. And he's just a brilliant guy. So there's an amazing story of Buckminster Fuller. He started a business when he was in his uh, early 20s. And the business, when he was 30, it actually failed. And he went bankrupt. And he was so distraught by this that he actually tried to kill himself. And he walked out into the ocean and his plan was to drown himself. And he tells this story, not in this book, but in another book, but he walks out into the ocean and he had a vision, a hallucination where he was pulled up into a white ball of light and he heard a voice come into his head. And the voice said to him, Buckminster Fuller, you no longer belong to yourself. You belong to the universe. And you will not take your life today because you are here to serve the universe. And his noted goal, so he obviously didn't kill himself. His noted goal uh, from that moment was to make humanity work for humanity. Since that day, he studied intensely for hours and hours and hours every single day. He received so many honorary degrees from universities and was honored as a genius Uh, towards the back end of his life. He just went from university to university, lecturing, teaching students. He was so ahead of his time. Uh, He's just so inspiring. It it really brings a tear to my eye, even just talking about him uh, because he's just such a a pillar of wisdom uh, and yeah, amazing, amazing guy. He, he writes in a very strange way. That's one thing that's quite challenging, but his whole life was based around this trust that he had that this was his noted goal, again, to increase the consciousness of people. And I believe he did that very, very powerfully. So the metaphysics of Buckminster Fuller, again, it's this trust concept. It's a really powerful image in Hindu mythology It's the image of dancing Shiva. And dancing Shiva, so Shiva in yoga is the Godhead. Shiva is the God of wisdom, the God of yoga. You know, he's the divine masculine. And in this image, Shiva is, half of his body is in a warrior stance. So if you've ever been into a yoga class, maybe you've done the warrior pose where your right leg is forward and you're, you know, really just kind of in attack mode sort of thing. So the right hand is warrior and the left, the left side of his body is like withdrawn and it's pulling in, it's in a surrendering state. Now he's in a ring of fire. So there's flames all around him and he's dancing on top of a baby. So it's a really fascinating image. If you've got your phone right now, just type in dancing Shiva and look it up and just check out this image. This image for me, perfectly epitomizes the flow state. How do I fight and surrender in the one breath? And this is the mythology of Shiva. This is the portal to the divine masculine. This is the portal to flow. There's been so many books written about flow. Oh, do we take these tablets? Do we do these things? Blah, blah, blah. None of that stuff is relevant. It's all just fluff. In reality, flow is a mental state that you acquire by having the courage to fight and surrender in the single breath. It's a Zen Cohen, let's say, a paradox, a perceived paradox. And this is something that I always teach to my clients and my students. Because the thing about entrepreneurship is this. We are fighting to create things in the world. We are pushing, we are striving, we are constantly in that mode. But the real growth, the real quantum shifts 
in your life will be found when you have the courage to surrender and let go of the rope. Let go of the reins and trust that the universe has some plan for you, some unique mechanism, something happens there when you can surrender and just trust. And I really believe this is something that isn't communicated very well, besides from these ancient symbols. And you see, this is really what I'm trying to get across in this podcast. You see, all of these books, this is what they share in common. They all can, so far, these books, they can all peer into this art of surrender. It's the science of action and the art of surrender. And I believe this is the way to grow. The next book is by Buckminster Fuller, and it is called The Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. This book was actually gifted to me uh, by an old friend of mine, and I have since gifted this book to many, many people. It's a very short book. Again, it was written much before its time. And I love this concept of spaceship Earth. And Buckminster Fuller talks about this. He says that we're literally hurling around the galaxy at thousands and thousands of kilometers per second around this black hole at the center of the galaxy. We are moving so fast. We are on this spaceship together. And how do we operate? How do we operate together as a whole? And Buckminster Fuller says that we've now reached a stage of abundance. We've now reached the stage of material wealth that we can take care of the whole of humanity. And he said that our real problem in life wasn't a material problem. It was a metaphysical problem. It was a knowledge problem because we were ignorant to our own power and that we could go one of two ways. We could go down the path of destruction and disdain or we could go towards the path of abundance and creating everything to maintain, to get rid of poverty, to get on the path of growth and fulfillment for everyone and make this vehicle, this spaceship Earth, work for everyone. So I love his perspectives. Very, very inspiring book. He talks a lot about system theory in the book. He talks about automation, which is fascinating. And I think that's incredibly inspiring for someone. He wrote this in the 50s, I believe, and he's talking about automation. So he was really, really ahead of his time and uh, someone you definitely want to study. My mentor, John Demartini, says that studying the great minds, studying books, is like putting your hand into a pot of glue. And when you put your hand into that pot of glue, you pull your hand out and it's it's all over it. You, You can't get it off. And he says, this is what it's like when you put your mind into this intersection with the greatest minds, the greatest ideas, the greatest mythologies, the greatest theologies, the greatest scientific discoveries that have ever informed us. That glue sticks and you can then go and create something meaningful. So that's Buckminster Fuller. Now the next one is a more recent book. Uh, This is called Abundance by Peter Diamandis. I love this book because for me, This book really strongly illustrates scientifically that the world is the most empowered and abundant place that has ever existed. He goes through and shows just from the birth and death rates, from the amount of time that we live on average, the life expectancy, from how many people die at a young age, from poverty, from food, from education, from medicine. He goes through all of these major qualities of health and life, and lifestyle, and quality of life. And he shows scientifically that we are the best that we've ever been. And you see, this is an interesting perspective because a lot of people that I speak to think that the world is in a bad place, that we're, oh, and right now, you know, we're going through a really interesting time with COVID and everything that's going on. There's blockages, there's things shutting down, there's all this restriction. But the reality is the data And the science says that we are living in the most abundant state that human beings have ever encountered and experienced. And I think this is incredibly important to own, study, and integrate into your life because you no longer become a victim of circumstance. And, oh, why can I have this opportunity? Or, oh, why can I have this? Why can I have that? Blah, blah, blah. Why me? Why me? Instead, you can say, well, I'm living in the most abundant time. What am I going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? 
again, go back to Buckminster Fuller. How can we make humanity work? You know, how can we all get to work for everyone and put ourselves and, and our minds to the biggest problems? And look, if anyone approaches me and starts saying, you know, the world is bad, the world is bad, this is a book that I just go, go and read this. And then we can come back and have a conversation about how bad things are. Uh, and obviously that doesn't always work very well. Uh, unfortunately, the people who need personal de- personal development the most are the most unconsciously unwilling to hear it. Okay, so so far we've gone through eight books, The Origin and History of Consciousness, The Story of Philosophy, Leonardo da Vinci, Steve Jobs, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Carl Jung, Metaphysics of Buckminster Fuller, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, and Abundance. All of this is teaching you how to think. All of this is showing the science, the art, the greatest minds, the greatest ideas, the greatest myths, the greatest philosophies that have ever informed us. But now I want to look more at relationships and how we relate to the people around us because reading the story of philosophy, you will see that you had these great minds, people like Friedrich Nietzsche and <laughs> this all the philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, Every single one of them faced a lot of hardship in their life. And the reason they faced a lot of hardship, and they weren't very good at relationships, they weren't uh, the most intimate of fellows, the reason why is because they pushed so far into the mind and they were specialists in that area, but they weren't very good at relating with other people. And I think this is something that the more you grow intellectually, you also, the more wisdom you acquire in your life, the more love that you want to study and seek. Otherwise, you'll become a very polarized individual. And perhaps like Friedrich Nietzsche, you'll end up in a uh, insane asylum for the last five or 10 years of his life because he was so miserable. You know, he was a, what you would call a nihilist, that the world is uh, you know, a miserable place and we, we can't ignore all of these miserable things. So <laughs> this book is Owning the Shadow by Robert Johnson. I believe that the world is a mirror. Everything that we see on the outside is a reflection of what's happening on the inside. And often when things really get us fired up, it's not that we're fired up at the person necessarily. It's that we're fired up at the reflection of ourselves and things that we have or have not done. So for me, this is a really empowering way to realize that no one is a victim and your shadow is just the aspect of yourself that you project onto other people. But really, we're the whole self. We have all traits. We have all of these aspects that we condemn others for having. Owning the shadow shows you how to pull that into yourself and become a more empowered person so that you don't need those projections, so that you can see both sides of politics and smile at the right and the left attacking each other. Or you can see, you know, the feminists and the misogynists attacking each other. Like, you know, these are the things that you can get past. You can rise above. You can integrate within yourself. And as a business person, I think this is incredibly important on your path because you stay balanced. I use this in sales. You if you've listened to my uh, sales podcast, I talk a lot about owning the shadow in the sales environment. The objections that you give are the ones that you get. Now that to me is scientific evidence because it can be observed that the objections that you give are the ones that you get. So that's a very interesting piece that perhaps pulls to a conclusion that human beings are more connected in a more unique way, perhaps some metaphysical way. We're very connected. Maybe we belong to the same unconscious. Maybe that's a shared space, not a uh, singular uh, entity. The next book is The Breakthrough Experience by Dr. John D. Martini. So Dr. John D. Martini has been one of my most impactful mentors. I believe he's one of the most brilliant people alive today in terms of his uh, wisdom and his genius. And he is definitely someone that you want to follow, you want to get to his seminars if you can. He's doing some amazing, amazing work in the world. I always say John is like a living Plato. You know, I've, I've found myself throughout his, like throughout my life so many times being like, oh, I wish that person was alive. I would love to talk to them. I wish that person was alive. I wish Pythagoras was alive. I just want to go and chat to him and see what he's thinking, what he's doing. 
John is one of those people. He's on that wavelength. He is so incredibly unique in the way that he thinks and the way that he solves problems. He's a polymath. Again, you'll notice that most of the people on this list are polymaths. People of very, very, very broad general study. And the reason for that is because when they study things so broadly, they begin to see the universal laws, the patterns that exist between things. And when they see the patterns, they can really, really give some uh, powerful wisdom. So the Breakthrough Experience as a book, and it's also a seminar as well, the Breakthrough Experience is the most powerful personal development seminar I've personally attended. And I've spent over $400,000 to go to these sort of seminars. So I've been to just about every seminar you can imagine. Been to tantric meditation retreats, silent meditation retreats. I've been to ayahuasca ceremonies. I've been to John's, many of John's seminars. I've read hundreds and hundreds of books, as you can probably tell. This is the one thing. If someone was to say to me, Ben, I want to grow as a human being, what specific seminar or thing should I do? You know, apart from obviously working with us at Systems for Business, which you should definitely do, is definitely getting into John's work because he's a profound genius. So that's the breakthrough experience. Definitely read that. That will help you to take anything in your life that you perceive as in the way, transmute it, turn it into on the way. John is a living alchemist. He is a person that turns base metal into gold. Perhaps you've heard the analogy of alchemy before, that there are these guys sitting there with pots and pans and all this equipment, these chemist style of people, and they were trying to turn base metals into gold. Now, really, that is simply a metaphor for the mental activity of turning base level emotional states into enlightenment or into gold. This is what the real alchemists are about there. It's a mental science. It's not a Uh, physical science. And John is one of those. Okay. So Talk Like Ted by Carmine Gallo. Now going through all of this will increase your mind, let's say, maybe not increase your mind, but you will be opened. Your mind will be opened to some certain perspectives and things. And that's very intentional because I believe that people with the most open mind are the people who really think differently. They just have a larger space and time horizon in their mind. And as a result, they've got a high level of consciousness. And as a result, they do meaningful things in the world. So this book specifically, Talk Like Ted by Carmine Gallo is, okay, how do we communicate this? How do we take all of this stuff that we've now integrated into ourselves, this art of surrender, this genius level creativity, this taking anything that's in the way, turning it to on the way, all of these pieces that I'm giving you, you want to be able to speak because now you want to pass that torch. You want to increase the consciousness of others. You have to know how to communicate. So this is, look, just an intro into the world of communication. I really believe you've got to go deeper into that. You've got to really study it and do it. You know, people often ask me, Ben, how did you learn to speak? Well, I started a podcast a lot of years ago with my brother. And when I did the podcast, I used to listen back to the podcast. And I noticed that there was a few things that I did in the beginning that weren't optimal. Things like saying, um, and ah, and just certain things that I was doing. And I just wrote them down on a piece of paper and I tried to eliminate them from what I was doing. But not only that, I also studied great speakers I looked at, okay, what are they doing? What are they doing? What are they doing? When when I heard something that was inspiring to me, there's a really good point that John has actually taught me. When you get a tear in your eye from something, it there's something there for you. And not a tear, a sad tear. I mean, a tear of inspiration. Like something really connects with you and you just go, wow. Like that's that synchronicity, that connection that you feel in that moment. You want to write those down because you want to search for those. And especially when you see someone speak and they get into that state and they inspire you, look at the strategy, look at what have they done? Look at what are they saying? Most of the time it will be from a story, I imagine. So that's very, very uh, important. Okay. Last book, The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer or Singler. 
I'm not sure if it's singer or singler, but it's written here singer, but I, I'm pretty sure it's singler. Anyways, this book is just, just really punching home this surrender concept. So this guy built a billion dollar business and his whole strategy was just surrendering to life and the moment. And I think that's really, really, really powerful. I'll probably blend that with a little bit of systems and strategy and the other things. So it's not all yin. There's a little bit of yang there as well. And that's a bit of a golden mean getting into the the two of those. So look, that should just get this surrender concept over the line for you. And I would really recommend going through these books in order. If you do do this, if you can be that one person or perhaps 10 people or perhaps 100 people do this, I guarantee you if you read these books and you go through them in this order, if so, someone was to come up to me and say, Ben, how can I live my life through more wisdom? How can I acquire wisdom? How can I have a more balanced perspective? How can I be a more empowered individual? I would give them this list of 12 books and I would say, go and read these 12 books. This would be my curriculum. If I was to start some sort of personal development program, this is the curriculum that I would take people through. So please honor that because this is me passing the torch to you. If you're inspired by some of the stuff that you've learned here, if you want to grow a life that you're in control of, a life where you get to choose what you do every day, how you do it, how to make money, how to serve people. If you want to increase the consciousness of others and the material wealth, either or, both is great, but perhaps you want to do one of those. Perhaps it's all material wealth for you and you're not really interested in the metaphysical stuff. I would encourage you to be. I really would because this for me is where the real gold of life exists and it's for that reason that a lot of these books are very challenging. You know, there's not many people on earth that would read these books uh, and I've given these books to many people and they said, Ben, they, they just don't connect with me. And I say, that's a shame because there's real wisdom here for you and I just don't think you're ready to hear it at that stage. Uh, but look, I would encourage you to really try, to really stretch yourself. There's a great idiom that a mind once stretched never retains its original dimensions. And really that's what we're trying to achieve here on the podcast. So look, if you do read these books, please reach out to me and ask me what's next because I got a lot more. And look, I would just love to connect with you. I would love to hear about your journey. I would love to hear what's going on for you as a result of that. And yeah, I would really love that if you can do it. So that's it for the episode today. I hope you've really enjoyed this two-part series. And if you haven't heard the other series, I'd really recommend hopping over. Look, we're not all yin. I know I've spoken a lot about metaphysics and philosophy and you know these very inspiring stories today and, and different things of a, a different angle to things that we've spoken of on the podcast so far. But that's very intentional. You know, this is a... I try and live through this dancing Shiva image. I want to fight and surrender. I want to teach you how to fight. I want to give you weapons that you can use to fight. But I also want to give you this understanding of the art of surrender. And that's really what uh, this podcast has been about today. Not everyone can do it because it takes real courage. I think it takes more courage to surrender than it does to fight. Because when you surrender, it won't make sense. And you have to let go of your conscious mind. And you have to really trust You've got to really trust that the universe is more beautiful than we've been led to believe, that there's something here, there's some connection between human beings and we can nurture that. We can nurture this connection that we have to the universe. And for me, all meaning in my life comes from that. Every, all my power, all of my everything just is found in that place and I would give my whole life for one or two of those moments as opposed to making a sale or anything of that nature. You know, this is for me the real purpose of my life. And if I can pass that torch to you in any way, if I've opened a door for you, that makes my life worth living. <laughs>